Okay, it's going. I'm sorry about that. I don't know why it's doing that. I think uh, it's just the internet and overall is a little slow at times, but uh, I'm seeing you just fine. And I think a lot of people are. There's a few people who are not. Okay. Well, I can't. Okay. The world of technology, we love it and we don't love it, right? All right, another thing I'm gonna pick up, I have a stick of vine charcoal in my hand here. And I always suggest having some vine charcoal in your toolbox of pastels because it blends beautifully with the pastels. It's sometimes just exactly the right tone and value. Just wanted to tar darken the bottom of these tree lines a little bit. There's actually some other little trees that are peeking in there in front. So I'm just going to use that a little bit and I'm going to darken this whole bottom part. Actually, I'm going to pick up a soft pastel. I want to get this a lot darker. This bottom row that's carving out the front fields of the snow bank, the snow field. So I'm going right over that. I probably could have done a little darker underpainting, but not to worry. I mean, I, I kind of, every time I do an underpainting, I kind of go, well, I probably could have done that a little different. There's so many ways to approach this. And I, like I said, I could have done a whole watercolor underpainting and um, then worked on top of that. In fact, I always, when my pastel workshops, there's almost always watercolor painters that are curious about pastels. And I always tell them you can take a bombed out watercolor painting and apply pastel right over that and oftentimes revive, or I used to I jokingly say, make a beauty out of a beast. So that's another really fun thing to try if you're a watercolor painter. So I'm gonna pick up a hard pastel now, a dark, dark brown one. And I wanna to start to indicate some of these larger trees. So for that, I'm taking the pastel right on the, right on the corner and I'm gonna to start to create the trunks of some of these trees. I'm, obviously, I'm not going to put in every single tree, but I want to kind of design it so I can start to go right over what I already have here. This is going to be a little fuller tree. And I can start to, depending on my touch, I can vary the stroke, vary the darkness of the color and let it kind of drift off. So a lot of this is going to be now um, I want to hit that sunset one more time, that yellow. It's really sparkly. It's really the center of that whole thing here. And I want to get a little bit more of this vibrant pink that's sort of setting right behind the trees here. before I hit put the trees over because it'll be harder to get back to it, as you can probably imagine. All right, then I can still come back in right, I wanna go right, over, right through that sunset. So I'm gonna start down at the base here and just start to do that. And I want it to come up in here and just let it drift off. So now it's going to be a lot of fun just playing around with these shapes and these little trees, these little skinny trees, and start to create the fullness of this bridge of trees here. And some of them are going to drift off to the side and don't want to get everything the same. And I could also, this will be a nice place to pick up my pastel pencils to get all the fine little, it's gonna take a little time to get all this and we'll do, get it all done in an hour, but um, you get a lot of it done. It's a fast medium, it's a fast process. So I'm designing as I go, you can see which, where the trees, which trees are gonna make it into the painting and which, is, which ones will not. So again, you can do this with the hard pastels. If I get a little sloppy, I can always cut in with the sky color, no big deal. And I can see I got a little blurb in here I wanna get rid of. So now I'm gonna just continue on with some of these 
trunks on this side. And down in the foreground, I want to play around with some of that. Um, I love that. I guess it's a wheat field or something peeking through. So I can come back in back and forth with some of this like kind of icy blue color of the snow. Again, I want to soften these edges because I ended up with hard edges from what do you the underpainting. Draw the trees with. What? Uh, what are you using to draw the trees with? Um, I have a brown soft pastel in my hand right now, a light brown. And when I was doing these big trunks, I had a, this little hard pastel, this little square stick, and I'm holding it on the corner, right on the corner, and I'm just drawing with it, like straight up, and then I'm letting my hand drift off. If but I want to get a hard pastel, it's a soft pastel. I'm using a combination. This one's a hard one. It's easier to control the hard ones, and I'm also using a brown that same brown pastel that I kind of started drawing with. So I'm going to use a combination, and with this brown pastel, with this pastel pencil, I can use it to get some of the finer, lacy kind of branches up at the top. So I'm and I'm pressing much lighter to get those. With one pencil, I can get a whole range. So if I press hard with the same pencil, like where I'm getting the trunk of a tree, like this, and then if I lighten my pressure for those skinnier branches, it's the same pencil. So I don't have to really switch gears there. I can just start to fill in as much lacy feeling of the stark winter trees branches as I want. And that's something that I'll, you know, I'll kind of do as I go and I'll step back. If I was working on my own here, I'd be stepping back and seeing, you know, how much, how many branches do I need? How many do I want to make it look full enough without it being too much. This is a charcoal pencil now that I'm picking up because some of these are really dark, especially where they hit right across the sunset. How do you sharpen your pastel pencils? Oh God, that is the always the question. I've tried every pencil sharpener known to mankind. And I sitting in front of me here, I have an electric pencil sharpener. And it works great for about well, for me, it works great for about four months. I find them on, there's one brand I like, it's called Exacto School Pro, and it has different sizes, holes for different, I have some of my pastel pencils are the Conti pastel pencils, and they're a little thicker than the other brands of pastel pencils, which are more of a normal pencil thickness. And this pencil sharpener below, below me over here, it has, a, I can switch sizes. And I really like it. It's a little delicate because um, they're meant for lead pencils and the pastel pencils are a little bit um, softer. And so you have to really be gentle in the pencil sharpener. And when the blades start to get old, which if you're, you know, I, I use it a lot. So it lasts me four or five months. I buy like two or three a year, but normal use would probably last you, you know, half a year or longer. That's one way, the tried and true way is taking a sand pad, good old sand pad, and um, an X-Acto knife blade. I don't know where I put mine right now. And just whittling it, whittling it, and then taking the sanded pad, sand pad, and just the old fashioned way, just get a nice, and you can get a really, really super duper point with that. So that's kind of the, between those two ways, that's how I keep them sharp. And once you get a good point on them, if you keep them sharpened, this is the charcoal again here I'm picking up because that's going to work too to, to create some of these branches. Um, but I always say it's like a surgeon's scalpel. If you want to get a nice thin line or like delicate stuff, you have to have a really good, good, good blade. So what was the name point. of the sharpener again? The Exacto Pro Sharpener? It's called, it's X-A-C-T-O, Exacto School Pro. I find it on Amazon and it, um, watch for sales. It goes on sale every so often. It's like $23 or something. It's really a good deal. Thank you. So here I am just kind of keep adding some more trees. Oh, I was working on that foreground. So yes, down here, I really like this kind of stripey pattern. 
Um, again, I'm, I'm using like the broad, well, no, here I used the broad flat strokes and now I'm kind of just, there's different ways. I'll show you some different kind of tapping strokes, mark making strokes. I can pull up like this, get some strokes going up for some of that stuff growing vertical. Um, just so fun. It's just so many different ways to move the pastel around and create different textures and different strokes. And then I get that and I want to still come back and forth with that really pretty purpley blue color that's peeking through and start to carve out. So I'm always looking for negative, positive, negative, positive shapes. And I'm just going back and forth with this kind of thing. So all these trees growing here, bunches of them. Some of them are going to be clumped together. And then there's this delicate where I lighten my touch up at the sky here and I'm going to get that whole lacy feeling. I'm going to pick up more of a bluish purple again down in here. I want to add some darker color right along the base of this, this tree line. It looks like there's all these shrubs at the base of the tree. So I can, again, I can vary the color without changing the value. So I have a dark blue and a reddish brown. And there's another way you can kind of hear me tapping at it. So that's another way to apply the pastel stick. I have a lot of fun with it. And then there's like good old fashioned like broken stroke where you can just go. I, I, I often will like move my hand into the direction that the earth is going. So, or the form of whatever I'm painting. And if I want to soften, like there's sort of a glow around these trees, that's where I'll pick up a pencil again and just sort of lightly skate over an area. That does some of my blending for me. So the colors still come through each other. Now it's just going to be now getting a lot of this changing directions here and getting a little bit of the sideways branches. So it doesn't look all up and down because some of them are growing sideways and angling. This is the charcoal again that I'm picking up. And I want to come back, back to my little foreground here. I like this kind of cool and warm play of color with the snow and the, I think it's wheat, I'm assuming. Again, I want to keep my form going. So there's this beautiful flow here of the earth here. And then it starts to come up a little bit right around here. Again, now I want to take that pencil thing again. I'm going to take a dark, well, I'm going to take a blue. I want to cool it off a little bit. And right around the edge where I have that really high contrast of light and dark, but I want it soft. So I can come right in with a pencil, a little bit of my finger too, and just soften some of these edges down. I find when I use the pencil that, um, it lets a lot of the colors still come through without over blending. Some of this darker blue I see down behind these trees at the bottom. Right, I'm gonna keep going down in the foreground here. I wanna develop that a little more. So again, I can go different kinds of strokes. I'm holding, I have a soft pastel in my hand and I'm just holding it on the corner and I'm gonna turn my hand so I can get a variety of strokes. And that's a nice ochre color. I wanna find a kind of a cool grayish blue. That's a little light. So I'm going over to my pile here yeah, so there's a more of an iridescent kind of blue that I can use with this brown ochre color together and they create a beautiful, beautiful shadow color. So 
So again, this is going to be a lot of texturing, a lot of uh, different kinds of strokes to get different kinds of effects. Do you ever wear gloves when you're painting? No, I don't. I do. When I think of it, I use a hand cream bar a hand barrier cream. I just, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't think gloves are bad or anything like that. I just never got in the habit when I started painting. And I just don't like, I really don't like the feeling of the gloves on my hand. It's just a personal thing. It's not, I don't really worry about toxicity or anything. The other wonderful thing with this medium is when I'm done here, I have a big stack of um, baby wipes and they'll just take everything off of my hands or soap and water in the house. I'm in my studio, which is actually building behind my house, but it's such an easy cleanup, which is um, another big plus for me in my book of working in this medium. I like, you know, to be able to really kind of put it down and walk away and not worry about things drying up or, you know, anything like that. So if I want to start to get some more of this texture of these little wheat things growing. They look very kind of bluish in some of the, in the shadow here. So I can take a pastel pencil now and just sort of play around on top of the soft pastel. You see it's kind of pulling it and pushing it around a little bit, kind of like moving paint around, but and it is paint, it is pigment. The pastel stick is pure pigment in a stick. It's really the purest medium that you can work in. So if I want to break this big band up, I can just interject some of the blue shadowing color. It's a quiet, quiet group. No more has, I thought there'd be more questions coming out. Mm, let's see, anybody have any questions? I'll just keep painting. I want to get a little bit more of this band of light. I like this band of light that's sort of shooting across the sky here. So again, because I can work light on top of dark, I can just interject these right on top of that base that I have there. Well, that's too dark. That was really dark. So I'm going to lighten it up, no problem. It's kind of a pink glow to it. And then I'll just show you if I don't if I don't like what I put there, I don't like what I put there. I can just go like this. I have a stiff old brush and I'm just brushing it down and I'm going to take my sky collar back and go right over it and it'll just disappear like it was never there. That's the one other wonderful thing with the sanded paper. It is very forgiving. Very, very forgiving. This is more the pink I wanted. So I want to kind of blend it into this area up at the top and I want to lighten this area up at the top because right above the sun, like right straight up from where the sun would be, it's getting this kind of interesting glow. Are you solely uh, pastel or do you sometimes use oil or acrylic in your work? Um, I do oil painting. Um, I've mostly been teaching pastels since the pandemic because it just, I don't know, it just seems like I've just been able to really do the Zoom classes with the pastels really easily, but I do work in oils. I don't really, I don't work in acrylics. I use acrylic sometimes for an underpainting base, but I don't use it as just its own medium. A little bit of watercolor, but mostly I'm loving my pastels. And what do you use as a fixative at the end? Um, no, I don't. I don't recommend using fixative at the end because fixative will really um, darken the colors. It doesn't like fix it like they like like the word sounds. Um, however, that being said, I sometimes use fixative 
in the intermediate stages, in the middle stages, if I, if I do get an area, like I might, I might, I, I could hypothetically like spray this if it was getting too filled up with pastel and I wanted to keep building up more. So there are situations where I use pastel, but not a, a fixative, but not at the end of the painting, because like I said, it'll darken the colors. It doesn't like fix it like the word sounds. You still have to, like a watercolor or a print, you have to frame it under glass. There's ways to store it if you're not going to frame it, but to protect it. But I, but ideally, at the end, you know, it's going to get framed under glass. So then, there's no fixative is going to. Yeah, I wish they called it something else because it's a just kind of confusing. You think it fixative, it would fix it. And you don't prepare the paper with a uh, primer for pastels. What was that? Do you prepare the paper, pre-prepare it with a uh, pastel primer? Sometimes, yeah, that's really fun. Yes, actually, that's really a fun thing to do. Um, with that, the question was, there's a product called Pastel Primer and there's pumice and there, I think Liquitex and Golden brand, both of those, uh, Spe Spectrafix, I think makes a brand. There's a different brands on the market of mediums that you can create more texture. And in fact, I did a demo last week in one of my classes where I was doing a field of dahlias. And um, I put that texturizing gel all over the field where I wanted the flowers and it created all this beautiful texture on top of the sanded paper. Um, you can create your own sanded boards too. You can use gator board or you can use um, illustration board as a backing you know, as a base, and then you could create your own texture. You could use um, clear gesso is another really good medium. Liquitex makes a product called clear gesso, and you can texturize a good board, a uh, gator board is really good for that. And create your own sanded surfaces. That takes a little finessing, a little getting used to, because you have to kind of figure out how much. It's a little bit of trial and error with that process. But um, yeah, that's pretty endless with pastels. I have to say that, that it's just pretty endless of what you can do. Okay, this is a little bit stronger blue I want to put up in this foreground to sort of separate it from the colors and values I have back there. Just want to get a little bit of this in here. Do you frame them at your own work or do you use a local vendor? Yes and yes. <laughs> If it's a small painting and I have a stock of frames that I do have, and um, I can definitely, if it's anywhere between like a, this size, this is six by 12, I could, you know, I have some six by 12 frames and I use AR glass, which is anti-reflective glass, and I can frame my own paintings that way. Um, if it's a larger piece, and certainly if it's a piece that's going into a show or a gallery, I, I use a local framer. Do you consider a six by 12 to be a standard or non-standard size? Um, well, it's not standard, but I, I have a few sizes that I like. And so I've acquired frames and in in custom made frames in that size. I love this size painting. I think it's just kind of sweet and small enough and it has a really good layout. I like the long landscape layout. Um, Eight by 10 is another size I like. So if it's a small, you know, I, I do have some frames. I don't stock frames or anything, but, um, you know, after you paint a long, long time, you would do acquire. Not every painting I have to say, not every painting I do has sold, but, you know, if it's sitting around too long, I'll take it out of the frame and I'll reuse the frame on a better, different painting. And, but like I said, if I'm doing a piece that's going to be entered into a, a show or into a gallery, I, I send it off to my framer. And do you ever use uh, rubber tip blenders or just your finger? Uh, my finger. I don't know. I, don't, I use the pencils and my finger. That's really my two things. I don't have any. I know there's people that use. Um, I don't even I can't even think off the top of my head, but there's other things, blending tools, but I don't find a need for them the way I work. Like I'd rather use a pencil because it's going to add a little thin veil of color versus just blending, blending, blending. 
So here's the charcoal again. I just want to add a few more trees. And I need some, I definitely need some sideways branches. But you can see why I had to get all that under underpainting in the sky and back background of it so I can come on with these beautiful lacy little trees. And then I'll probably use a lot of pencil. I'm using like a more of a golden pencil, like a brown, like a burnt sienna right in front of the sunset. It's got a lot of red, kind of red glow to it. The branches coming up right in front of the sunset. So this is going to be just a bunch of different direction lines to create that beautiful lacy feeling. Again, if I want to, this is that, that hard pastel again. Some of these are a little stronger and I can get more done quickly, like just laying it this way, turning it, turning it this way. And letting some of them go right off the paper so that it has a flow to it. A little bit of a bluish glow on some of these trees to separate them from that dark band of trees behind it. I'll start to come forward, give it a little more dimension. And a little bit more I want to do in the foreground. So here I'm pressing a little harder. I want to get a little stronger color um, and I'm turning it. I want to just kind of create this fun pattern of the field. Again, I'm paying attention to the curve of it. There's a little, oh, pff, a little bit too much curve there, a little bit of curve. So I can come in with the snow color and... What was the brand of pencils again? Um, I have a couple different brands here. I have Carb Othello as one brand and Conti, C-O-N-T-E, Conti Pastel Pencils. Not to be confused with Conti crayons. Sometimes people get a little confused. Conti makes pastel pencils also. So so I can see how quick, how, what a fast medium this is. I wanna put some of this pretty blue. Oh, I should mention that down below, you can't see it on here, but I have people often say, what about the dust and the mess? Down below, underneath my painting, I should have said that in the beginning, I have double wide masking tape sticking out halfway underneath my painting a ways down and all the little dribbles stick right on the tape. That's a really easy fix for any kind of so-called mess that you might be worried about. It doesn't get in your lungs, it doesn't get in the, on the floor. It's a way to really keep your studio clean and it works great and it's really inexpensive. You go to the hardware store and get a two inch wide roll of masking tape. And I wanna do one more thing up in here that kind of lost this other little dip of um, little shrubby trees that are growing. I kind of like that separation. Get this a little lighter, I mean a little darker in here so the trees look a little lighter in front of it. So I like where this comes down. So there's like kind of like this flow here and this flow going back that way. So it's almost getting to be three. So anybody still have questions, let me know. If you're interested in classes, um, I my website, I list all my classes and the Dillman's workshop will be up there and you can go to their website to, it's still a little ways off, but It'd be so nice in October to actually see real people. It'd certainly be nice to be in Wisconsin. If you're anxious to try out before the class, before you go to a workshop, um, I teach weekly Zoom classes and they're all listed on my website, which is just my name, susankaziski.com. I just uh, posted the link to your site and our site on, in the chat line. So if you want to get ahead, a jump start, and then be all ready for Dillman's in the fall, you can do that. I have a one-day workshop coming up at the end of this month, which is also painting 
winter colors. It's all on my website. And then you'll be all set for Dillman's in the fall. And even if you don't do my workshop, I highly recommend you do a Dillman's workshop because it is so worth it. I was supposed to go back there last May and have my big come back after 20 something years of not teaching there because I've been out here and then COVID changed our plans. And but, you were with us twice 20 years ago, right? What? You were yeah. with us twice 20 years ago. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think you were a little boy, Scott. I was. I remember clearly. <laughs> you were a little boy. Uh, Sandy e e is asking if you're working uh, upright. And so you yes. have this. Oh, yes. Yes. That's a, a great question. You have to work upright with pastels because there's a fair amount, well, not a lot, but there's dust. There's little dribbles that have come down onto my tape. And, um, I can just show you because it's easy to pull this up. Yeah, there's little dribbles that come down on the tape. And if I were working flat, then all those little dribbles would just sit on my painting. Not good. So yes, you want to work up, up and down. That's different for many watercolor because watercolor painters don't do that. but other painters, other mediums are used to working up and down on an, on an easel. Good questions. So I think I could finish this up. It's gonna require just some more up and down strokes and I probably uh, post this on the Facebook page when I finish it, if you wanna check back on the Dillman's page. And um, I'll get it finished and posted in the next week or so, if you wanna check back. So there's gonna be a lot more lacy kind of stroke brush work here, I mean, pastel work. But you can see how you can kind of create more and more of that with a, corner of a pastel or a pastel pencil. And I'll get it filled up as much as I feel like it's necessary to make me happy. So my darker trees will be kind of in the middle here so I can pull attention more into that sunset area. I like that contrast between the trees and the sunset behind it. So I'll focus some more branches and medium and small branches up here. And that is how you paint a winter sunset with pastels. Well, we are almost exactly at an hour. Uh, that is perfect timing. Yep. All right, folks. Any last mm -hmm. questions before we sign off? Uh, a couple people have definitely said how lovely it is and they really enjoyed how you sort of interpreted the color uh, from the original source photo and sort of not done an exact copy, but done a nice play on your interpretation of it. Thank you all. Thank you all for showing up. And okay. uh, give us a, a ring if you have any questions about other workshops. Uh, we'll have a demo next weekend uh, with Jennifer Stone uh, doing watercolor pours. Uh, but Susan um, is on our website, dillmans.com, and you can reach out to her. Uh, her website is uh, linked on our site as well. And uh, you can follow up with any questions. We're here to help you guys. All right, signing off. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. See you all next weekend.